yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the Tonga eruption. And so this has been active since around December, uh, the most recent phase of activity. Um, and, and it's um, located on, on what's actually a really big volcano, but which is underwater for the most part. Um, and it, it, it's about 1.5 kilometers high and about five kilometers wide. And, it, and it's something called a caldera, which is uh, a word which means cauldron, basically. And it's shaped like a cauldron. So it, it, it's got steep sides and then inside it, it curves down. And that's because it has a history of, of very explosive activity. And, and this most recent example of the uh, 15th of January is, is just a, another example of that. So in December, there was a, um, a series of island building events where there was just enough volcanic activity for it to peep up and, and then build the islands around it. Um, and then on the 14th of January, there was actually a, a really big explosion, um, really getting up to another 18 to 20 kilometers. So that was made much less impact than this one on the 15th of January, but creates a bit of confusion because people could look at one picture and think it's the the 15th of January plume, but it's actually the 14th of January plume. Um, and the most recent data is the 14th of January plume was, was actually significantly smaller, went to, um, in terms of the size of its umbrella cloud, which we can see easily from space, it went up to about 20 kilometers and emitted about 0.4 megatons of sulfur dioxide. And we, and we look at sulfur dioxide in particular because it's very easy to measure from space. There's lots of instruments that do that. There's one in particular that I work with very closely called TROPOMI, and it's a, it's, a, it's a satellite instrument which measures the whole planet every day. And um, you can do that with a resolution of about 3.5 by 5 kilometers for each pixel, which doesn't sound like a very high resolution, but when you think of the whole planet, it's a lot. And, and we can see a lot of detail in these in these images. We've actually been using that a lot for doing analysis of SO2 fluxes from all sorts of eruptions. So I might come back to that at the end. But, and so on the 15th of January, the, the, the difference between the event of the 14th of January are primarily that the um, umbrella cloud was much bigger and bigger diameter. Uh, there was an awful lot of lightning. There was about 100,000 lightning events detected. And, and you get lightning produced in a violent er, eruption because of ash, um, pieces of dust basically moving very fast, acts like a Van de Graaff generator and can produce a very high static electric charge that then discharges to the ground. And, and of course, the most famous other two aspects of this explosion on the 15th of January was the creation of a big shock wave that was visible propagating through the atmosphere at high speed and a much lower speed, but probably much more damaging tsunami of a, a similar wave, but propagating through the sea um, and generating meter high waves all the way across to the States and in Peru and Japan. And obviously very locally and very potentially very tragically in Tonga. We still don't understand yet what the magnitude of the impact on Tonga is. And they obviously had a double hit. One hit was the big ash fall because the diameter of the of the umbrella cloud, which was formed over the eruption site, uh, was about 250 kilometers at least, whereas the distance between Tonga and, and the and the volcanic eruption was is only about 50 kilometers. So it was going to be completely covered by ash. It happened at night time or just at dusk, and so it probably if it had happened during the full day, it would have been as if the sky had just gone completely black and, and like the sun had disappeared. Um, but it happened at night time, so um, it, it probably wasn't easy to understand what was happening apart from just lots of ash and then the tsunami coming. So it must have been quite terrifying for, for people there. And I imagine there'll be some shocking stories, sadly, that will come out of this. And that's the that's probably the most important thing to remember about this whole eruption is that there's a massive human and, and, and societal cost uh, to the people, particularly to the people in Tonga, but also everyone affected from the tsunami uh, across the Pacific. Um, and then now we ask ourselves, you know, what was the trigger for that tsunami? What was the trigger for that hyper explosive eruption? And, and I'll be honest, we're still trying to figure it out because there's a couple of things which are confusing. Number one is that there is um, an overpass for a satellite called Calliope, which measures the heights of clouds. And it measured a, a height of cloud for the 15th of January event to be around 20 kilometers, which seems to be exactly the same as that was that produced on the 14th of January. So that's that's unusual. 
But there have been some other reports which say it could be up to 30 kilometers height. So there's a bit of a discrepancy in our understanding of, of what actually happened in the dynamics. And so the first job as scientists will be just to unravel what exactly happened before we get to the detail of the mechanism. But already we can speculate a little bit on the mechanism and it's going to be mostly driven by um, two possibilities. One is it's a great big collapse of material down the flanks of the of the uh, volcano, which can displace, push a large amount of water, which then creates this big tsunami. But the other possibility, which I find intriguing, it might not be physically realistic, and we, we need to do some, some calculations to find out. But one would imagine that the propagating wave, which was visible from space, propagating through the atmosphere, would have been propagating downwards as well into the sea and would then be able to push the sea down and, and then push it out, creating a sort of a wave. And that is, if that's true, it could be an, an unusual trigger for a tsunami and, and something which I'm not sure has been really studied before. So that's purely speculation and it could be, could be wrong, but it, it's a very interesting question that deserves further um, thought and calculation before we can exclude it or include it. And the final interesting thing Again, from space, we saw the amount of gas released, and it seems to be exactly the same as the amount of gas released on the 14th of January, which is really peculiar and very, very surprising. And it could be that some of the gas is being absorbed into water droplets or into the ash, and it's just being lost. But even that is, is unusual. So I think we have to wait and see a few more days to see if over time it's possible that more SO2 will become uh, visible um, as, as there's an evolution of the cloud. Um, and I guess the final point I'd say is, is that this eruption really shows how strong we are now in terms of our capacities for monitoring volcanoes from space. That our satellite, Earth observation satellites have just come up, uh, improved steadily and, and probably quite quickly in the last few years, in the last decades. We, we now have, have got an unprecedentedly high frequency of measurement and spatial resolution and a whole series of different uh, instruments which are measuring these things from space, which means that when these events happen, we have a much better picture of it. And, and I think back to the big eruption of 1991 in Pinatubo, which was observed from satellites as best it could be, but 40 years ago, we didn't have anything like the capacities we do now. And if we, if we had a similar eruption to the 1991 to Pinatubo now, we would be all over it and we would see a completely different insights into the dynamics and, and the, 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 the mechanisms which were driving that eruption. Um, and th these these tools are now becoming really almost operational in terms of volcano monitoring. Um, I've been working very closely with colleagues um, in the Canary Islands on, on the La Palma eruption, which is from September to December 2021. And we were calculating with my team in the University of Manchester. We were measuring um, the SO2 flux, that's the kind of mass per time coming out of the um, uh, volcano from space using these daily measurements from Tropomi and doing a clever analysis of it to try to derive exactly how much gas is coming out, which turns out to be quite a complex thing to do. We've been developing this for the last decade, but now we've got the really amazing data from Tropomi and this tool to, to analyze it. And together we can provide the, the scientists and, and the local authorities on, on, on big eruptions with a really nice time series of what's going on with the SO2 flux. And in the case of La Palma, it was really useful because it showed a, an exponentially decaying curve in SO2 flux, um, which was used to help forecast that the eruption wasn't going to go on forever, but was likely to end um, probably around early December. And, and we were talking about late November, early December as an endpoint in, in late October. Um, and, and so that was a partial success as a, as a forecast of a, the cessation of activity, which when you're Dealing with a disaster, uh, like a, an ongoing eruption, knowing when it's going to end is actually incredibly important information. So to conclude, I, I think the main points here are that there's still lots we don't know about the mechanism. Uh, the most important thing is about the people on the ground in Tonga itself and, and across the Pacific who've been affected by the tsunami. And we have an amazing potential and opportunity to, to leverage these new satellite data to have a deeper understanding of, of what's driving these volcanic eruptions and how to forecast their dynamics.